Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all here this afternoon. We were waiting just a couple more minutes. We've got a number of ticket holders who have not arrived yet, but it's time to get started. My name is John Blades. I'm the director of the Flagler Museum, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here for the 29th annual Whitehall Lecture Series. The purpose of this series is to provide some context for America's Gilded Age to help us better understand the world in which Henry Flagler and his colleagues lived. Um, let me just take a minute to remind you to turn off your cell phones. Please don't assume that you've got them off. Please check uh, and make sure because um, we don't want to wake up the person next to you. Um, also, let me remind anybody who might have walked in with an audio tour one, would you hold that up and so that that can be collected by the staff? Those audio tour ones, sometimes um, the, alarm, the internal, internal alarm can be set off by the AV system in this room, and that's really uh, a jarring experience. These um, lectures are webcast live. So if you find that you can't make it to one of these lectures one day that you'd like to enjoy, you can join us live via the internet by going to the museum's website and going to the lecture series webpage and clicking on the link there. You'll be able to see the slides we see here among the live audience, or the present audience, I should say, uh, and as well as hear the uh, speaker and even submit questions at the end of the lecture. So I welcome not only those of us who are present in the room today, but those of us who've joined us via the internet for this lecture. I want to thank our sponsors as well, the Max and Victoria Dreyfus Foundation and the Palm Beach Post for helping to make this lecture series possible. And I want to thank the staff. The museum staff puts a lot of work into making these lecture series possible. And uh, I appreciate the hard work they put into it. In fact, you found at your chairs a couple of uh, publications from the museum. One, uh, a membership brochure and perhaps more importantly for this season is a season program guide, a guide to all the programming here at the museum this season. So I hope you'll uh, find other things you're interested in in the season program guide and join us for many of the other programs we have here throughout the season and throughout the year at Whitehall. Um, and by the way, if you can't join us for our webcast and you can't make it for the live lecture here in the Grand Ballroom, these lectures are uh, posted on uh, a web channel the museum created a couple of years ago called the Gilded Age History Channel. So you can actually find more than 100 lectures there, uh, or I should say videos there, related to subjects uh, from America's <coughs> Gilded Age. Our speaker today, and by the way, our, our theme this year is Crimes of the Century. Uh, and judging from the size of the audience, I think uh, if it bleeds, it still leads. Um, or crime still pays in some way, I suppose, for authors and lecture givers and audiences and museums. Uh, our, our lecture today uh, is going to be given by Edward Ball, um, who is the author of five books, all nonfiction, including the one we'll be talking about today. Um, Edward Ball's first book, Slaves and the Family, was an account of his own family's history as slave owners in the South. This is South Carolina. It won the 1998 National Book Award for nonfiction and was on the New York Times bestseller list and was featured by Oprah. Edward Ball lives in Connecticut and teaches at Yale University. This lecture, by the way, is sort of a, a trifecta for me. Not only does our lecturer share the name, share a name of a famous Floridian, Edward Ball, probably most of you know about Ed Ball in Florida, but the subject is a Gilded Age subject, a story about a a photographer and having worked as a professional photographer part of my career, I'm very interested in this particular photographer and photography in general. So I'm very much looking forward to this lecture. Uh, our subject in this lecture is a guy named Edward, though you probably couldn't tell that from the way he changed his first name spelling, uh, Moybridge, who was an eccentric and talented uh, photographer, invented stop motion photography. They wanted to answer the question of whether there was ever a time when a horse was galloping or running that all four hooves were off the ground and stop motion photography answered that question and led to motion pictures. However, shortly after working for, with Leland Stanford to answer that question, Leland Stanford, a former governor of California and the person who founded Stanford University, um, Moybridge got some bad news that maybe his child wasn't really his child. <laughs> 
And so our story today is uh, the story of the context of that situation, what happened as a consequence. So please join me in welcoming Edward Ball to the Whitehall Lecture Series. Thank you all. It's very good to be here. The story that I want to tell has several protagonists. This is the first protagonist, Edward Myridge, the photographer, in a series self-portrait that he made about 1880. And you may notice that he's not wearing any clothes. <laughs> now, there are going to be several pictures of naked people in this talk tonight, so fair warning. <laughs> if anyone, parental warning, if you need to leave the room, please feel free to do that. And I wanted to get the first one on the table right off the bat. The second protagonist, Leland Stanford, standing in the middle of this group of people, president of the Central Pacific Railroad in California, here at the completion ceremony in Utah in 1869, when the transcontinental line was uh, knitted together, the western half being built by the Central Pacific, the eastern half by another, the Union Pacific. Here he is at the early peak of his power. These are very unlikely companions and friends, which they would become. The third protagonist, <laughs> this was a gun that every man west of the Mississippi owned in the period after the Civil War, particularly Californians and people in the mining industry. Moybridge owned such a weapon. The story begins in this house on the top of California Hill in San Francisco in January 1880. California Hill now called Knob Hill because of all the nabobs who moved up there in the 1870s following Leland Stanford who built this house for himself and his wife and son in 1876. 50 rooms, 50,000 square feet, this was before the Beaux-Arts style uh, took over the elite residences uh, in the American landscape, and so you don't see its influence. Three people lived in this house, Leland Stanford, his wife Jane Lathrop, and their son, Leland Stanford Jr., as well as 15 servants. It was a house where the rooms, not unlike Whitehall, had names. This was the so-called Pompeian Room. The Stanfords employed furniture makers and decorators Pottier and Stymus in the mid-1870s to decorate the interior. Twenty-five years later, the same firm would decorate the interior of Whitehall. Pottier and Stymus was favored by those who would build so-called artistic houses, meaning the 50 and 75 room houses of the prince merchants and prince industrialists of that generation. Every square foot was decorated and designed, often with themed plans based upon myth, music, or literature. The Pompeian room was so-called because Pompeii had recently been excavated um, south of Rome, and some of the idioms and the visual um, patterns were working their way into interior design. And Pottier and Stymus persuaded the Stanfords that the murals that they would place on the walls were similar to those excavated at Pompeii, and the furniture that they would have designed would resemble that of the Roman era elites. And it was in this room in January 1880 that Edward Marbridge came to entertain a party. Stanford invited some of his friends, including the man called James Flood, who was a silver magnate 
and the governor of California and the senator from the East Coast in for an entertainment where Moybridge would unveil his new machine. It was a device he called the Zupraxiscope. It was effectively the first motion picture projector. And Stanford had uh, employed and collaborated with Marbridge for some years to develop stop motion photography. And this night, it was going to be debuted. Some of the first photographs that Marbridge had managed to make arresting the motion of fast moving animals were these, uh, those photographs of horses owned by the Stanfords. And if you had come that night, you would see something like this. On the horse is Leland Stanford Jr., the boy, on his own pony. Running behind is a groomsman. Moybridge had taken photographs and then found a way to project them, which nobody had done before this night. Typically, the invention of cinema is dated to the 1890s, and it's placed in the hands of Thomas Edison, and in the hands of two French brothers named Louis and Auguste Lumière. But some 20 years earlier, Moybridge was doing this. Here he is soon after that night. Edward Moybridge was born in 1830 in a town southwest of London called Kingston. He was the son of a corn factor, a man who sold corn, and he was not uh, of the educated classes. Uh, only one in a hundred boys would go on to university at that time, let alone women, of course. Uh, and Moybridge was not high enough in the social ladder to do that. So his education stopped at age 15, and he became an apprentice in printing in London. But at age 20, he decided to do, in the year 1850, he decided to do something highly unusual, which is to immigrate to America. Oh, I should tell you, Moybridge had a problem with names his entire life. He men I mentioned the Zupraxiscope. Well, he was born Edward Muggeridge. He changed his name five times. <laughs> he moved to America. He became Ted Muggeridge. He moved from New York to California. He became Edward Moygridge. He changed one consonant in his name, Edward Moy Bridge. He must have been up late at night murmuring different versions of his name to himself as a way of going to sleep. Then he became a photographer, and he elected to choose one name. The prerogative of an artist is to call herself himself by one name. He called himself Helios, the god of the sun. Finally, in mid-life, age 50, he chose his last iteration of his name, Edvird Moybridge. Edvird, and this is the way he is known to historians, as Edvird Moybridge, the medieval spelling of the name Edward. As a young man, the only photograph of him without a beard. He moved to New York, as I said, at age 20, in 1850. What else is going on at that time in American life? California is going on. Gold was discovered in 1848. 50,000 young men made their way to California, making San Francisco into an instant city. Myridge, some time later, five years later, joins this flood. In 1855, he moves to San Francisco, which is now a town, a city of 60,000 people. He's not there to look for gold. He's there as a bookseller, which 
is a curious thing to do in a pioneer town. He moves onto this street, Montgomery Street, uh, right on the harbor, facing the bay, and he lives there on and off for much of the rest of his life. He realizes at a certain point that selling books and prints to a population that is mainly interested in making money and less interested in literature is not a good path for a merchant. New York at this time has 220 libraries. San Francisco has one as a sign of uh, kind of culture of the pioneering uh, days. In, mid, in his mid-30s, he decides to change paths altogether. He becomes a photographer. He learns somehow, I'm not sure how, the ways of something called wet plate photography, which is this uh, technology where you had a glass plate that was coated with uh, a kind of emulsion and you had to prepare these plates and insert them into these large cameras. This was the uh, cutting edge photography of the 1860s. Muybridge, as you may have begun to sense, was an eccentric man. He was not very good with people. He was, uh, in fact, he decided at, his, at the outset of his photography career that he would not do the sensible thing, which is to take portraits of people. That was and remains the bread and butter of photographers. And if you set up a studio, you could make a good living. Margaret did not want to take photographs of people. He decided that he would take photographs of their belongings and of their land. And here's a picture of the house of one of his early clients. And um, curiously, if you hire a photographer to photograph your house, to show how well you've done for yourself, you might want to be in the picture. But Moybridge puts his clients in the paddock with the horses and the manure <laughs> over here, instead of on the porch of the house, which is obscured by a tree. A very peculiar framing, if you like. He lost his clients. <laughs> he went to Yosemite Valley, and this is where his life changed. In 1866, 67, he hired some pack mules and guides and took his heavy gear into that seven mile long gash in the central Californian landscape with its sheer face uh, rock mountains and its tissue-like waterfalls. And he made some of the signature images of the American West. His Yosemite series was wildly successful. It was successful in the United States on the East Coast because California and the American West represented something to the Eastern, Easterners, something like possibility, like uh, grandeur, something like the rawness of, of uh, untouched uh, natural beauty. Marwich took with him a stereo camera, which had two lenses. This was a device that produced a kind of postcard that was the earliest form of 3D photography. You may have seen these stereo cards. If you put them into a viewer and look through uh, the, uh, the eyepieces, you see a three-dimensional image because each photograph is slightly out of uh, synchrony with the other. And these were uh, very popular um, parlor uh, collections for middle-class Americans, and he sold thousands and thousands of them and suddenly had a big career at age 38. This is a picture of his uh, photography studio, if you like, in Yosemite. Um, he 
Down here, he writes his name Helios, scratching it into the emulsion. Wet plate photography meant that you took this flammable goo, this clear flammable goo called collodion, and you took it into a dark room, in this case, just a hanging uh, tarpaulin, and you poured it in the dark onto a 8 by 10 plate of glass and tilted it until it was uniformly covering the glass and then you plunged that glass into a bath of silver nitrate which is the light sensitive compound that uh, makes photography work and all of this happening still in the dark you mount this uh, plate into a camera then you have five minutes to take a photograph. After that, you take the image back into the darkroom and you develop it with another series of chemicals. A very cumbersome process, not at all like what we uh, experience today. While in Yosemite, Joseph Moybridge had one of his assistants take this photograph of him. kind of a madman would sit on the edge of a rock with a drop of half a mile. This photograph would come back to haunt him at the murder trial. <clears throat> Leland Stanford. He was born outside of Albany on a farm, one of five brothers in 1824. He was the brother whom his parents who ran a pub, as well as ran a farm, decided to spend their money to educate. The others, they did not. He was sent to uh, boarding schools in upstate New York, and as a young man coming out of what was then considered higher education, this was not Yale, this was not college, these were so-called normal schools, which were sort of advanced high schools, he went to Albany and apprenticed himself in a law firm. Doesn't this man look, he's a handsome duck, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Doesn't this man look as though he's patterning himself after Abe Lincoln? Look at that. Well, as it happens, Stanford would become a, an important Republican politician uh, and acquaintance of Lincoln some years later. He decides that he wants to go west, but not all the way west. He moves to Wisconsin. Before doing that, he marries his teenage sweetheart, Jane Lathrop of Albany, the daughter of an accountant. And that way, Stanford is marrying up. And they move to a tiny town in Wisconsin, about 100 miles north of Chicago on Lake Michigan a no-place town, but it was one of the towns that was being settled by the westward migration in the 1840s. Stanford doesn't like it, and moreover, his four brothers have all gone to California to pick for gold. And they are writing him letters. This is 1849, saying, Leland, come out here. We're making a lot of money. It's rough, but his brothers then <clears throat> open shops that sold supplies to other miners, such as bags of rice and pickaxes and tents and whatnot. And they made more money that way. So Leland Stanford decides he's going to do just that. And about age 26, which is rather late in the day for a, a migrant to California, he moves and opens a store in the Sierra foothills. Meanwhile, he parks his wife in Albany with her parents, something that she resented for the rest of her life. For three years, she's in Albany while Stanford's trying to cut his path in California. This is his store in one of the miners' camps, the Stanford and Smith store. You can see their name up here, Stanford and Smith, and they're selling uh, food and and supplies and liquor to uh, miners, a much more stable business than actually 
trying to get gold out of the, the mountains. And interestingly, look at this, Cantonese. Why is that? Because a quarter of the gold miners were Chinese immigrants, and their money was good too, and Stanford wanted to make them feel welcome. And so, a Cantonese sign. He makes a good uh, start. He moves his store to Sacramento. It's the capital of the state, but the second city of the state. San Francisco is, you know, by this time, 75,000. Sacramento, 12,000 people. The capital of the state. He moves his store to the main drag in this uh, still somewhat of a cow town. And opens for business there. Next door is the Huntington and Hopkins hardware store. The Stanford store is to the left on this picture. This is the Huntington and Hopkins hardware store, run by Collis Huntington and Mark Hopkins. The three men become friends. They also befriend a guy called Crocker. And they are something of the leading businessman businessmen in Sacramento in the 1850s. Comes to town a promoter, a bounder, named Theodore Judah. He is a railroad engineer who has done some short 25-mile lines back in upstate New York. In 1853, he comes to California, and he's obsessed with one idea, which he talks about with everyone he meets, that is, a transcontinental line. The only way to travel from the west coast to the east coast during these days was by ship. So if you're in New York, you take a steamboat to the Nicaraguan coast, you take a mule train over the mountains, then you take a steamboat up the west coast to San Francisco, or you go all the way around the Horn. If you go all the way around the Horn, it's three and a half weeks. If you go the Nicaraguan route, it's two and a half weeks, but you might get malaria. There's another way, of course, which is the stagecoach, which is a six-week uh, journey over impassable roads. So, a transcontinental train, but who's going to pay for this? It's an idea that Californians think is good. They are the uh, the isolated state far from the center of American life. Well, something goes in Judah's favor, and that is called the Civil War. Here's why. Stanford <clears throat> gets involved in politics in the 1850s. He's a Republican. He runs for governor. He loses, but he's, and it is, it's, mainly, it's mainly a democratic state at this point. And, um, <clears throat> but he and his friends give Judah a few thousand dollars to design a survey, to make a survey of the Sierra Mountains, showing how the train can go on switchback up the mountainside and then down the other side of the range. He does that, and in December 1860, South Carolina secedes from the Union. Then. Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and the other of the 11 Confederate states. Uh, these promoters of this railroad know that they need to have some sort of government subsidy for construction because the vast expense of, these, of this project could not be undertaken by uh, a private uh, entity, at least not of the scale of the private entities of that time. So Judah and Stanford make their way to Washington. When, the, when they get there, they find that there is a Congress that is sympathetic to this idea. Because Congress, by the way, all the Southern congressmen have left Washington and gone south to join the Confederacy. The only congressmen left in Washington are Northerners. These Northern congressmen are anxious to keep California in the Union. How would they do that? By offering this line, this lifeline. Uh, Lincoln is a former railroad lawyer who uh, likes this idea, and suddenly these men find themselves with a subsidy, a mile-by-mile -mile subsidy that will pay 
for construction of the western half of a transcontinental train. Construction begins in 1862 and continues for seven years. Stanford is named president of the Central Pacific Railroad and he goes within a very short time from being an important local merchant and politician who's lost a couple of elections to the man who runs the largest new industrial operation west of the Mississippi. This is a photograph from the construction of the railroad and as we all know it was built by Chinese Americans and there are some Chinese workers in this photograph, one of the few photographs that documents this, some 25,000 Chinese immigrants contributed to the construction of this train, which crossed from San Francisco through the Sierras, through Nevada, to Utah, and as you see, laced the country together. Stanford, who was very prosperous, becomes remarkably prosperous. There is some speculation that the subsidy money is supposed to go into the right pocket and the personal money is supposed to go in the left pocket, but sometimes there's a confusion between the left pocket and the right. Stanford occupies the nicest house in Sacramento. There he is sitting on the porch with his wife, Jane. And he becomes a charter member of this class of Gilded Age tycoons. His wife gives him a private rail car for his birthday in 1872. His wife, Jane, is 38 years old when she has her first child. Remarkable at that time. She felt blessed to have had her son, their only child. However, there are lots of nannies around. She doesn't look after the boy so much, so she collects. This is a painting that she had commissioned of her collection of diamonds, a painting that still hangs today in the Stanford University Art Museum. Stanford was made into a hero when the train was completed in, the 18, in 1869. He was lionized. It was considered a savior uh, of the West and the Western economy. However, this very quickly went sour. Within two or three years, farmers, uh, other transportation operators, such as stage manager, stagecoach managers, and uh, steamboat guys saw that the railroad was charging whatever rates it wanted to because it had created a monopoly in freight. And here is a cartoon that introduces Stanford's nickname that would follow him the rest of his life, which was the octopus. Here the octopus has in one eye, Stanford's face, in the other eye, the face of Crocker, his partner, and they are strangling farmers, and they are shoveling money into the state house to corrupt politicians to get certain um, uh, real estate uh, favors through. This was the perception of Stanford very quickly after he became the most important man in the West. Now, at a time in the 1870s, there were no houses like the one we're in, Whitehall. And in the West, people lived generally in clabbered houses. The railroad men built houses on the top of California Hill that were completely new in their scale and ambition. These are three of the four uh, that stood side by side on the top of the hill, the Hopkins house, the Crocker house, the Stanford house is not in this photograph. There's one thing to point out about this picture. The house of Mark Hopkins, right here, 
has a strange thing behind it, and that was because Hopkins wanted to have an entire city block to put his house on, and he managed to buy out everyone from their two-story cottages and ask them to move, but there was one guy who would not sell, an undertaker named Young. Young would not sell. So what did Crocker do? What did Hopkins do? He built a 40-foot wall entirely encasing the man's house, yeah. cutting off light and air, making it uninhabitable. Trying to make a point, but you don't trifle with the railroad men. And this wall, which was famously known as the Spite Fence, became a tourist attraction and a symbol of what the public believed was the uh, indefensible domination of the economy and politics by the railroad barons. Stanford <clears throat> begins to collect horses. He buys 10,000 acres south of San Francisco and he names it Palo Alto. He builds another house there of similar scale, and he begins to collect thoroughbreds and standard breads. This is a picture of Palo Alto, the uh, horse farm belonging to the Stanfords in 1872. You can see the barn in the back and several paddocks towards the front. And Stanford is, by the mid-1870s, a very polished, very uh, satisfied man of means. He's a man who wears tuxedos at home. <laughs> he has a silver-tipped cane, and he is virtually, according to all accounts, a wordless conversationalist. <laughs> he is phlegmatic in the extreme. By contrast, he meets a man named Edward Moybridge, whom he hires to photograph one of his houses. Moybridge is the most important landscape photographer of the day, thanks to those Yosemite pictures and many others that followed them. But he is a very different sort of man. He lives out of a suitcase, he has strings on the cuffs of his pants, holes in his hats, a beard that he declines to comb, and he is nervous and agitated and very wordy. So two very different people. Stanford asks Moybridge to photograph his house in Sacramento, which he does, and then he begins to think about his horses. Stanford thinks that there is the likelihood, as a horseman, by the way, he has placed himself shoulder to shoulder with the Vanderbilts back on the East Coast, who are also horse people. And he is entering his trotters in competitions, they are winning, he is entering his racehorses in races, they are winning. He becomes a horseman hyphen philosopher. He spends his days in a swivel chair placed in the center of a track on the Palo Alto farm, following the galloping horses around, swiveling around and around and around. And he becomes obsessed with this question, do the hooves of a horse ever leave the ground? Are horses ever airborne during their gallop? The theory of unsupported transit, it is known as the theory of unsupported transit. Curious historical irony that a railroad man becomes obsessed with horses whom his industry is making obsolete. In any case, Stanford believes that yes, they do. He hires a painter to depict his horse named Occident, airborne. He hires Moybridge 
to try to answer this question by photographing Occident in a gallop. Moorbridge tries it. In 1872, at Palo Alto, he can't get the image into focus, and then something happens. He meets a woman named Flora Downs. She is a photo retoucher. She works in the studio of the gallery that sells Moybridge's work, repairing damaged plates. If there's a tiny scratch on the emulsion of a glass plate, it looks white when you print the photograph. A photo retoucher paints that scratch away, makes it disappear. Or if there's some imperfection in the sky, a photo retoucher will work on that. She does this. She's 19 years old. Moybridge is 40. What happens? He becomes interested for the first time in photographing people. He asks her if she would model for him. This is Flora Downs in the left of the photograph, standing at uh, the beginning of one of these petrified forests that are tourist attractions in Northern California. This is Flora Downs sitting. This is a bizarre photograph, if there ever was one sitting among taxidermy, taxidermied animals. <laughs> These are dead, stuffed animals at an amusement park in San Francisco. She is married, wants a divorce. Moybridge helps her to get a divorce. They marry, and he buys a nice house in a neighborhood called South Park, which was a townhouse neighborhood just going up, the fanciest place that he's ever lived, and sets themselves, sets them up there, sets it up as Flora's uh, domain. She becomes pregnant. He photographs her standing in the seventh or eighth month of her pregnancy with a cascading bouquet of pears. She gives birth to their son. And then Moybridge abandons her at home and goes on his traveling work, traveling up and down the coast, photographing things in Alaska for the government, photographing lighthouses in, in Southern California for the government, photographing so-called Indian wars that are taking place at the time, photographing things for Stanford, she becomes, at age 22, she's very dissatisfied. She begins, gets involved with uh, another man whose name is Harry Larkins. I don't have a photograph of Harry Larkins, but everybody said that he was a very dapper Englishman who uh, wore tweed suits, and he was a theater critic, and he was 27. And he begins to take her while Moybridge is out of town and while the baby is being nursed by a hired nurse, take her to the theater. They become involved, they become lovers, and there's some question whether they had become lovers before the baby was born. Moybridge comes home one day <clears throat> from one of his trips and finds the house empty, and he finds a photograph on the mantel of his son. Now remember I told you he had problems with names. You wouldn't believe the name of his son. Florado. Flora plus Eduardo, which is the Spanish iteration of the name Edward. Florado. He finds a picture of Florado on the mantelpiece, and on the back, he's never seen this picture before, and on the back is scrawled, it says, this is our beautiful boy, love Harry. Marwich goes into a fugue. He is blinded by rage and despair. He goes to the cabinet 
and takes out protagonist number three in this story. And he knows that Harry Larkins is out of town in a mining camp near Napa. He goes up to that mining camp and at midnight on a Friday he knocks on the door of this house. Harry Larkins comes to the door. Marbridge says, Harry, I have a message to you about my wife. And he shoots him dead in the doorway. There's a sensational trial at the Napa Courthouse. This is a town population, 2,500. At the top of, in the middle of the valley that's now famous for its wine, but at, at the time, the wine industry was only beginning to get going. This is the year 1874. It's a ranching district. <clears throat> the Napa Courthouse, because this is where the crime was committed. The, the trial does not take place in San Francisco. Now, Myridge, the crime was witnessed by seven people. Furthermore, Moybridge gives an interview to the San Francisco Examiner in which he explains how he killed Harry Larkins and says that he, is not, uh, he has no regret about the crime. But his lawyer, who Leland Stanford procures for him, decides that there is a possible defense, and it is insanity. He brings that photograph into the courtroom, the photograph of Moira sitting on the precipice, and he says to the jury, this man is clearly a madman. <clears throat> Moira testifies, no, I'm not a madman. I would do it again. Now, this trial is going on at a time when the telegraph has been laced across the United States. So, if you're in New Orleans, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., New York, Boston, Chicago, you're reading about this trial the day after each day of testimony because reporters, for the very first time, are able to go down to the telegraph office and dictate their stories, which are then shot across the country and become the earliest form of national news, the simultaneous national unfolding of news events. These telegraph wires, not coincidentally, run, side, run along with the railroads. When the Stanford Railroad went in, the telegraph wires went in next to it. So news is unfolding at an accelerated pace, and it's possible to have a national uh, criminal uh, case being discussed by people all over the country. The case was the Moybridge case. Trial goes on for some time, and the verdict comes in from the jury, not guilty. Now, why would that be? The verdict was defended as a matter of what was called justifiable homicide. This is also known as the provocation defense for any attorneys, right? The provocation, the provocation defense says, in so many words, if someone is threatening you, you can be provoked to defend yourself with deadly force. Famous today in the Stand Your Ground laws. The provocation in this case, according to Moybridge, was his wife's adultery. And he was provoked to take deadly retribution against another man. Now you might think this is an unusual twisting of the law, but it was not unusual at the time. All male juries, right? 
Moybridge's lawyer makes sure that all the men on the jury are married men. Uh, <clears throat> many men got away with assault and murder using this defense because juries bought it, even though the judges in the judge in Moybridge case says, told the jury explicitly, do not acquit on the basis of justifiable homicide. Meet the requirements of the law. So this was a sort of populist uh, common law verdict that was quite, uh, quite ubiquitous at the time. Now I looked and I looked and I looked for a case in which a woman used the justifiable homicide, used the provocation defense, and got away with killing her sexual rival. Could not find one. But there were hundreds of cases like this. So Moybridge gets off. He goes back to work for Stanford. Here is Stanford and his family on the lawn of the Palo Alto house in full leisure regalia. This is Stanford over here with his son Leland and his wife Jane, some in-laws, the Palo Alto manor that lies behind. He says, Moybridge, now let's get back to work. 1877. What do you need from me, Moybridge? Says Stanford. Here's $50,000. Just build it. Moybridge builds a primitive, what we would call today, movie studio. He builds this shed with a long open window and puts 24 cameras in it, side by side. He puts a white fence tilted back to magnify light coming down and reflecting onto the surface of the track, which he covers with a white powder. The idea is to get the horses to gallop past and each camera take one photograph of the galloping horse. So the first try, he ties strings across the track and the horse gallops and breaks the string and uh, pulls a shutter on each camera. But the strings are breaking at different intervals. So he designs a kind of electromagnetic triggering device that shoots each image at a precise interval of an eighth of a second before the next and the next and the next. And he manages in the summer of 1877 to arrest the movement of Occident, Stanford's horse, his favorite trotter. And these pictures become quite famous. They are published in Scientific American. They are uh, sold as cabinet cards, as you see, uh, all over the place. They're awarded uh, prizes by scientific societies in Europe. It is a turn in Moybridge's life that changes his uh, direction from a photographer of landscapes into something like a, a, uh, a science photographer, which is the way he describes himself. And it makes him into an even well-known, more well-known name. He's not quite satisfied with this. He takes these images and he arrays them on a disc the size of a dinner plate around the edge. He says to himself, I'm going to project these images and make them move. And so he does. He builds that device I showed you before and he puts pictures in motion for the first time. Really quite beautiful and still stunning after 140 years. That leads us up to January 1880, the mansion in San Francisco, where he debuts his zoopraxiscope to the private party that the Stanfords are holding. <clears throat> 
He becomes interested in the movement of human bodies. Here he is, shoveling and swinging a pick and walking up and down stairs. He becomes a traveling speaker who fills lecture halls. You could make a living, as he did for many years, giving talks and showing pictures. He takes his Zoopraxiscope on the road, he crisscrosses the country, and shows his images to many thousands of people. At the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, he builds a pavilion where he is the resident spectacle with his device and his moving images. Now, what does he call his attraction? Zoopraxographical Hall. <laughs> Something sours in the relationship between Stanford and Moybridge. Stanford dislikes the fact that Moybridge is getting national press and he was traveling in Europe and being received as a kind of uh, visionary by the scientific societies as well as the art world. Uh, the art world loved his images for their beauty. The science world loved his images for their precision and their uh, and technical uh, advances. Stanford doesn't like this. He takes a number of Moybridge photographs and he publishes them in a big book called The Horse in Motion, leaving Moybridge's name off the book, taking credit for the pictures himself. He was, after all, the man who paid for the pictures. Who owned them? Was it Stanford? Was it Moybridge? In Stanford's view, Moybridge was uh, the house photographer who executed the instructions um, that came from, from his uh, employer. In Moybridge's view, uh, Stanford enabled research and invention that would not have taken place without his own invent his own hand, there's a lawsuit. Moybridge sues his old friend Stanford. He loses the lawsuit. Their relationship is destroyed. What happens to the boy, Leland Stanford Jr., is a very sad story. <clears throat> he was raised in uh, extraordinary uh, circumstances as you can see from uh, the photographs. Uh, and he was educated by private tutors, and he was given a free hand to take an interest in what he wanted to do. And in his early teens, he took an interest in uh, antiquities. So his mom and dad gave him money to collect antiquities. And they went on these um, collecting tours in Italy and Greece and uh, in Turkey, uh, buying artifacts for this 13-year-old, 14-year-old boy. And on one of these tours, they are in Florence. The Stanford Jr. is 15. He comes down with a fever, typhoid fever, and he dies. His parents are bereft, and they, in a year's time, decide that they will recover by establishing a university in his name, the son's name. Leland Stanford University is designed and built on the lawn of the Palo Alto house. This is the Palo Alto house, in front of this house. And it opens in 1893. 